So Tavi, in the second part of our discussion, I want to focus on equities and then the miners. I want to show this chart first and foremost. This is a very interesting chart. You're showing the relationship between U.S. equities and Chinese equities. First of all, can you describe why we've seen a correlation? And uh, I guess secondly, why you think uh, this divergence is likely to uh, rectify itself and reconverge? Well, I do think it's one of the, the, the risks that we have here in the markets, and it is a more deflationary risk than inflationary. And that's given the levels of valuations we have in equity markets. And this divergence is such an important one. China really is a credit bubble, in my opinion. I remember back in 2018, we used to talk about it, and the economy was about $40 trillion worth of, uh, of assets in their banking system. Now we're at about $52 trillion. And so it's a 314% of, the, of their GDP today. And when we look at the banks in the Chinese uh, market, uh, you know, industrial and commercial bank, it's, it's about what, a $5.2 trillion uh, assets alone, which is about twice the size of JP Morgan. It's now about 40% since February 2018. So uh, there are a lot of signs there. You know, if you look at the required reserve ratio has been declining, it usually tends to uh, lead to a, a little bit of a devaluation of the currency. So I think that divergence that we're seeing right now, it is signaling that the market could slow down. You can also see the same issue if you look on a year over year uh, basis of that of that line uh, versus the, the ISN PMI here in the US. You can also yeah. see that that tends to slow down uh, the growth here in the economy. So I am I, I when you ask the stagflation question, I think that that could lead to a stagflationary environment because uh, for a brief moment, I think inflation is going to be stickier than the, the, the deceleration of growth. And that's a big problem. And so um, I don't, you know, obviously CCP has, the, the CCP has been uh, proceeding on this uh, crackdown over the domestic companies. There's yes. a lot of people that think that that's, you know, that's just happening in China, but you know, let's, you know, this chart is to prove that China is not isolated. The Chinese economy is not isolated to the rest of the economy, uh, world economy at all. And so be careful with that assumption in my opinion, uh, and, and consider the fact that that may lead to a, a systemic sell-off in the global equity markets. Well, Tavi, couldn't you, couldn't one make the argument that uh, the equities markets for the Chinese side, they've overreacted to the crackdown reg and the tightening regulations happening from the CCP. And in fact, the yellow line showing the Chinese equities, that's been beaten down too much. It's undervalued. It's maybe the Chinese side that will catch up to the blue line. Would you agree or disagree with that? I would disagree, but there's certainly a lot of folks that fall into the category of, of looking at that chart and making that assumption. That's a fine assumption. I think that that's, uh, that's why there's a market that for every buyer, there's a seller. And I think that the reason why I don't fall into that category is because I have studied the diligently uh, what happens with credit bubbles. And in my opinion, this is a, a great example of one. I mean, this is a, a closed capital account economy I've never seen any economy like that build up a $52 trillion banking system in that way. And so I'm a little concerned that that leads to that. That's not the end of the world. It's just a, it tends to lead to a, a deceleration of growth that could be a total credit bust, by the way. Uh, but there is a there is definitely a lot of control from the PBOC side. And that's why I think that at some point it leads to the evaluation of the Chinese yuan instead. Uh, okay. in order to recap those banks. If you Okay, one, one more question on this chart and we'll move on. If you take a look at your side note there, you said that, uh, well, divergence between Chinese equities and U.S. equities in the chart, play it to Crest gets advantage, and, you know, it, bottom line is U.S. markets have followed the Chinese one down in the past. So what when you say followed down, what is the magnitude of this downward action? Because if you look at this yellow line, this Chinese stocks have corrected significantly from the tops of last year. We're talking about... We're talking about a uh, close 20, 30 percent correction, right? Yeah. Just the broad equities index and specific stocks have corrected even more. I mean, that hasn't happened in the S&P 500 since, uh, well, last March and then before that, 2008. Yeah. And there's a reason why we saw this kind of weakness in the dollar as well, because the, the level of the policies have been so extreme relative to other parts of the world. And that's because of the dollar is the reserve currency of the world and allows the Federal Reserve rightly or wrongly, to do what they have been doing more than other places. And that uh, d definitely uh, it tends to uh, uh, to help on the growth side more than other places that are not supposedly uh, capable of doing so much of this. I mean, if the, the Chinese yuan is is, is a is a bad currency uh, and, and 
for whatever reason, their M2 is today at about $36 trillion with a smaller economy than the US. The US M2 is somewhere close to $21 trillion. When we talk about money printing uh, in the US, I think a lot of folks have not looked at the credit growth in China has been astonishing. And I think it's uh, it's one of the issues that we're seeing. There's a lot of signs in the in the Chinese markets that tend to lead to issues in the overall economy. And that's something yeah. I pay a lot of attention to. One of them is the implied volatility of Asian currencies. We're seeing that picking up recently, especially in three month and six month horizons. And that tends to lead to uh, a, a, actually an increase in the VIX. And so I am paying attention to those things. It's just one small part of our, our a, a significant, but a small part of a, our, our, our portfolio uh, because I view it as an insurance. Uh, in other words, I'm referring to a, a put option that we have in the Chinese yuan relative to the dollar. Um, and that has been uh, worked very well over the years for us and uh, some other years it didn't. And it doesn't cost us the whole year as a performance. It's just an insurance at the way I view in, in our portfolio. But someone, tell me, someone might look at this chart and say, well, that's a scary chart because that implies that well, what you're implying with the downward arrow is that the blue line is going to fall to the same extent as the yellow line. Uh, I mean, is that is that is that more or less what you're implying, or do you think that maybe the correction for the S and P 500 will be a little less dramatic and less, uh, and the time span may not be so short? Well, look, it's uh, it, it, the the point of the chart is not to be uh, dramatic, even though I agree with you, it's definitely very dramatic when you look at, and uh, it certainly suggests that we should be a lot lower than where we are today. It wouldn't surprise me. But look at the multiples that we are trading today. In the equity markets, you look at median multiples, aggregate multiples, average multiples. Everything looks expensive, uh, from from the tech sector to uh, the only thing that is cheap today in the markets. Really, if if I'm not going to go down to the nitty gritty, really is just the commodity size. The natural resource industries yeah. are actually really cheap, but the other parts of the market are extremely expensive. And so uh, I think there's a lot of issues. And yeah, in the past we've seen some brutal declines in the equity markets. Am I suggesting that that has to happen? No, it does not have to happen. It goes back to that commodities to equity ratio. I don't know which one's going to work. The commodities are going to go up a lot, or is it the equity markets that are going to go fall a lot? But it's a spread trade. And that spread trade, the beauty is if you find two asymmetric bets on both sides, it's what becomes very compelling. That leads to the uh, mining side of the conversation now. Starting with this chart, real free cash flow yield by sector. And you're showing that the gold and silver miners are the only sector that are sh that is showing positive free cash flow right now. That is very uh, true. On a year-to-year yeah. -year percent change. Yet, at the same time, as you know, the miners have been con considerably beaten down from the all-time highs last year. So talk to, us, talk to us about this sort of uh, uh, divergence in fundamentals here. We've got great, great, great cash flow, but really poor stock price performance. What's going on? Well, it, it is incredible how they're really building up this cash balance right now and paying down debt, improving their balance sheets in a way that we haven't seen in the past. I mean, we saw other times in history where uh, the comp those companies were making money, but they're actually not prudently, uh, financially speaking. Right now, there is a sense of conservatism and skepticism by investors forcing those companies to be conservative. And that is the key part of it, which I'm seeing. Uh, there's another chart that I have that shows uh, that we haven't even seen the M and A, uh, you know, the, the cycle start, uh, which is quite interesting. You know, we that is the one of the the, the elite innings indicators of, of of the precious metal cycle. We haven't seen that yet, and I think that what's happening is that there's a lot of fundamental growth happening in in the mining space, along with a lot of embedded uh, growth itself. I mean, we're seeing free cash flow growth in in numbers that we haven't seen in the past. Uh, and those companies are actually uh, improving their margins uh, and their cost is not increasing as much as other industries just yet. Um, I, I would say that even, even relative to other commodities, even the base metals or agricultural commodities, the precious metals companies look extremely attractive right now. I don't know necessarily why, um, I, I would say I have a few uh, theories for why the uh, cap, uh, capital allocators are not seeing this as an opportunity. One of them is the fact of that skepticism in the industry. We've been through 25 years of capital of being capital destroyers, and th those companies didn't make any money. They were just losing money and misallocating capital everywhere. Uh, and so, right now, we're seeing lack of exploration. Uh, capex budgets are not increasing to the levels that you would expect 
to the levels that we are with gold prices. And folks are so hung up looking at gold prices while those companies, who cares? If gold prices stay where they are, uh, those companies are extremely profitable. And so that is the whole point of it. It will create at some point a huge liquidity floodgate that will come into the, the, the very exploration projects that are very high quality, uh, which will be, uh, those companies are going to have to replete, uh, uh, replenish those reserves of those, those, uh, those major producers that have been really depleting those reserves for so long. That does lead to a, a very good point. So hypothetically, let's create a hypothetical scenario. As a gold mining investor, what I would like to see is my investment in a senior or a junior, doesn't matter, whatever the case may be, outperform gold even during a, a gold bear market, which is what we've seen. In other words, I like it to diverge away from a bear run when gold declines. That obviously wasn't the case because we've seen them both fall together. But hypothetically, if I were to see my mining investments go up during a bear cycle for gold, what does the miner need to do? What does the sector need to do to bring that kind of optimism to just the equity side? Oh, it's going to happen slowly. The first thing that is going to happen, in my opinion, is the attractiveness of those gold miners and silver miners and even copper miners that will start becoming more uh, fundamentally attractive than other sectors. Let's put it as an example, tech industry or tech sector. Uh, today is the first quarter or so that we've seen free cash flow yield for the gold miners to be above the, the free cash flow yield for the tax sector. And so those are the, the, the beginning of the changes for a lot of quant investors that tend to uh, create those screens looking at uh, fundamental data. Uh, those guys are starting to see those show up. Uh, another thing is uh, we're seeing this, this real uh, improvement in the balance sheet side. It's going to lead to my, in my opinion, to dividends. Uh, we may see uh, companies are starting to pay down yes. dividend, which is something we haven't seen in a while in a large degree. Uh, we're seeing that happening in a lot of the energy companies already. And so it's a matter of time. They, they have the money. They will do that, in my opinion. And that's going to track capital, too. So those are the types of moves that they should be uh, doing uh, soon. And, and that's, in my opinion, going to be the thing that will uh, uh, in increase. I mean, if you look at pension funds and large capital allocation, they don't have any allocation towards miners today. And so I think that that's a real asymmetric opportunity, in my opinion. I'm very focused on those miners. And I think that it's time to own a lot of the explorers where uh, there's a lot of high quality projects that have been bidding up in the last uh, years or so. Uh, and like I said, as those companies become fundamentally strong, they're going to be more likely to to, uh, to start an M&A cycle. So um, um, I think that that's, uh, that's going to lead to a lot of appreciation in those smaller names too. One final chart I want to show. This is really interesting. Commodities versus mining labor market. A classic early sign, you write, of a commodity cycle. Mining industry, non-farm payrolls near historical lows, labor and capital constraints are the amplifiers of bull market and resource stocks. So in the red line, you're showing the uh, U.S. employees and non-farm payrolls in the mining industry. In the yellow, sorry, the white line, rather, you've got the equal weight commodity index. So what we're seeing right now is, again, a divergence. What does this chart tell you? Oh, so many things. First of all, this chart almost speaks for itself. But at the same time, I mean, if you look at those bottoms in the red line, where we've seen the difficulty of, 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 of finding labor in general, certainly leads to a large appreciation uh, in, in, or at least a, a bottom in this, in, this, in this levels. I mean, we've seen this happen uh, for some time now with CapEx really diverging from, uh, from the actual price of the metals. Uh, in the last, uh, you know, 24 months and 36 months or so, and those those are important parts. I mean, if you are in the mining industry, you know that has been it has been incredibly difficult to find skilled labor. Now, on top of that, uh, the infrastructure in place has been also very di been di difficult to find. Uh, we've been struggling finding drill pads, uh, even the the right uh, drillers to do the job that we need to in the exploration side of uh, some of the the projects we've been funding at Cresca Capital. And so uh, I think there's a, a quite a lot of very interesting signs that this is not a, a, a usual thing that happens at the peak of the market, certainly. And so uh, you know, the amount of geologists that we're seeing, I mean, there's, a, there's a lack of geologists worldwide. Uh, and so uh, I think that those, those, those problems, which started really with the ESG issues and the green revolution that, uh, you know, in a counterintuitively way, uh, really began to, uh, to, to make those companies not uh, spend money and spend capital towards uh, those industries. And those industries are now starting to get very attractive. 
not only the energy sector, but the precious metal sector. The entire commodity space looks really attractive. I have another chart looking at the, the energy related labor market as well. It looks very similar. It's, it's difficult to find labor market in the energy sector too. Yes. Um, and so it, this is happening. It's a problem that is happening globally. Uh, and I think that usually it's, it's another early uh, signs of, of where we are in this, in this secular bull market for precious metals. It goes back to the M&A cycle thing. Uh, it goes back to usually companies that start to really lever up at the end of the cycle. We're starting, we're seeing the largest repayments of that in history. Uh, we're seeing really large free cash flow numbers. Uh, you know, cost of uh, of things as a whole have not begun to rise in a significant way. Operating expenses are still relatively low compared to other uh, peak cycles that we've seen, uh, especially 2011. And so there's a lot of signs that we're still at the very bottom here. Uh, I wouldn't say bottom, but I should say early innings uh, to mid innings yes. of this precious metals uh, secular bull market. Let's put all this together now, Tavi, for the audience. We've got uh, your bullish outlook in commodities, you're bullish in the miners, obviously. However, you're cautious about the broad equities index in the U.S. as a whole. So given these, uh, I would say, uh, different uh, or almost contradicting outlooks, would you be buying miners right now or would you wait a little bit before before getting in, if you were somebody on the sidelines, let's say. Well, first of all, I want to point out, I don't have the crystal ball, but I, I would. I would because I see all the the, the macro signs or are, are, uh, writings are in the wall right now. So it's pretty clear to me uh, that the, the financial, you know, if you're, if you're not a believer that the fiscal stimulus will continue to be the case uh, and that the economy will be able to grow organically without the need for fiscal and monetary stimulus, that there is no need to suppression of interest rates going forward. If you are a believer of that, do not touch this whole industry. I don't believe in that. I think that uh, we have started a, a lack of discipline that started in the 70s. We're now seeing uh, the real problems of this, and it's probably going to lead to inflation. And those are the times when you have a difficulty of finding alternatives of investments that yield above inflation. Those are the times that you want to own uh, commodities. And when I look at precious metals, they are the cheapest ones now so relative to uh, even overall commodities uh, today, especially silver. And so I like the miners quite a lot. I think that you can go down the list and take the explorers too and the developers uh, if you want to take higher risk. But also, you know, uh, there's also higher risk uh, uh, embedded in those names too. And so, but I like I like that as an opportunity for the next few years. I, I use the word contradicting because that assumes, of course, the word contradicting assumes that they both fall together. It's possible that the S&P 500 falls, but the miners outperform, right? It's possible. Well, we've seen that actually in the Great Depression uh, in 1929. Uh, well, home stake mining was going up at that time uh, while we saw a major decline in equity markets. We saw 1973-74 uh, when there was a, a real a stagflationary kind of bust where inflation was rising still and the economy was turning lower. What happened was miners diverged from the equity markets. And in 2000s, where we saw the tech bubble starting to bust and that the miners really began to, uh, were highly correlated to the equity markets at the time, they declined together and then they started to diverge massively. And so, uh, you know, people tend to fight the last war because they, they remember what happened in a way and they remember what happened in March, uh, 2020. But that's not necessarily the case in history all the time. I, I would say that most times, especially in what we're seeing right now, uh, where folks would be very much aware of what the Federal Reserve would do if there is a 30% decline in equity markets, what do you think they would do? Immediately would be accompanied, in my opinion, by large amounts of monetary stimulus in order to uh, to fix the issue. And fix, I mean, not necessarily really fixing the problem. And so I think that that's what creates the, the possibility of a divergence in the future. But I don't need to be right on that. I, I think that there's a lot of, uh, I, like I said before, the convexity in this trade is quite interesting, in my opinion. And so the commodities to equity ratio spread uh, should continue to lead a higher price. And I don't know which one is going to lead which way. But in my opinion, commodities look extremely undervalued right now and still are uh, poised to go much higher. All right. Well, fantastic thoughts. We covered a lot of ground today. Thank you so much. We'll catch up with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you for watching Kiko News. Stay tuned for more.